Have you ever seen the gargoyles high atop a Gothic church? They represent the demons of hell. They are outside the church because that is where demons belong. They are not inside the church because every church is heaven. Demons have no place in heaven. Every church is heaven because that is where there dwells the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ himself. That makes it heaven. Moreover, the most momentous event in time occurs in church, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Every church is its own world. When we enter through the doors of the church, our intellect, our heart, our senses tell us we are in a different world. Everything in that world, everything in church, prepares us for one thing, the Mass. What an elaborate preparation. We ought to take a look. I am Father John Perricone, and welcome to the most glorious act, our conversations on the Mass. Throughout time, many attempted to influence the course of the world. From Alexander the Great to Julius Caesar, from Albert Einstein to Madame Curie, they have left their imprint on history. Yet only one man changed the future everywhere, forever. To all he offered eternal life, he was God made man. Today his sacrifice is present in the Most Holy Mass. You too can take part in it. The liturgy is so rich that, you know, no, many, no, no matter how many times you participate in the, the Mass, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, it's like you hear different things different times. I mean, there's just always new phrases or, or new understanding that I think can come to us over a lifetime. And because it's so rich, uh, I think that it's uh, much uh, easier to pay attention during the Mass because even if your, your mind does start to wander, there's always something there to bring, it, bring you right back to where you are, uh, which is just another example of, of the richness of the liturgy. church has always taught that man needs things before he understands. That, of course, comes from our friend Saint Thomas Aquinas. He said that it's impossible to get anything in our mind as clearly understood unless we first seen it and touched it in some way. That's the way God made us. That things in the mind, invisible ideas, only come from things that we see because we're made of body and soul. In fact, our Lord himself has set down the blueprint for the way in which he would save you and me from our sins and bring us to heaven. We know that way, that blueprint, when he became flesh in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. My goodness, our Lord could have saved the world in any number of ways. He did not have to come down from heaven to become a man. One word would have been sufficient. He's God, after all. He's all-powerful. But what is it that he decided to do? He decided in his sovereign will to leave heaven, second person, and take flesh from a virginal mother, and through that flesh, through his manhood, give us everything that we would need in order to go to heaven. In fact, his humanity, his sacred humanity, becomes like our bridge to heaven. That sets up a rule that without physical things, the physical flesh of Christ, sacred humanity, all the physical things that constitute the sacraments, 
Without them, we cannot receive sanctifying grace, which is invisible. There's the rule. The Roman Catholic Church is called sacramental because it is through things, physical things that we can see, that we receive invisible grace, something we can't see or feel. When we enter a church, that rule is working. The whole church, my goodness, every church is like having a hundred teachers, each one in their turn are saying something to us, preparing us for the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Let's begin. How about beginning at the beginning? Let's go outside church and let's first look at the first teacher. The first teacher is what is above the door. We cannot help but notice it is called a tympanum. And in that tympanum, we see the last judgment. Immediately, a Catholic has the right idea about what's about to happen to him. Before he even enters the church, he knows that church is all about preparing ourselves for heaven. The smallest child could see that because he looks up and sees our Lord in judgment. He knows that something serious is happening here, very serious. And little children understand that. We must never underestimate them. These signs that they see fill them with wonder. We should never patronize our children. We should recognize that they have to be uplifted. They want to be uplifted. They don't want to be left with children's things. They want to be lifted up to the truth, noble things. And then, of course, we see steps. Steps are very important in life. Steps are all about going up. They are all about ascending. They are about leaving behind lower things and going to higher things. When we speak about heaven, we talk about it being up there. We know it's not up there. But why do we say that it is up there? Because it has to do with height, higher things. We are always going for higher things. We talk about achieving a higher knowledge. We speak about higher virtue. In the Gloria of the Mass, we talk to our Lord, refer to him as being God who is all highest, altissimus. And the steps are reminding us of that. What do steps involve? They involve me moving my feet. So what's happening is that soul and body are moving together. I'm going up toward something. My soul is ascending to higher things. That's the reason why the church declares as a rule that the altar must at least be ascended on one step. In many churches, maybe yours, the church is above on 10, 11, 12 steps. The more steps, the better. It helps us to know we have to be going higher all the time, higher and higher. Our Lord says in the parable to the man who was humble enough to sit at the back of the table, he says, come up higher, ascende superius, come up higher. The steps are the first lesson, the first teacher that we're coming in church, this is about higher things. We enter the church. It is a different world. It doesn't have windows as my house has windows. They are filled with color filled with people, filled with mysteries that even a little child would be able to understand, even an, an illiterate could understand. They tell the stories of our salvation. Then, what do I see? A long, long aisle. What is the purpose of that? It's just not there for itself. It's there to teach us that our life here on earth is a very long journey. We must not become impatient or become tired because at the end of the journey, there is Christ waiting for us. And what do we see? The crucifix. The crucifix is simply a symbol, a beautiful, wonderful symbol. But what is behind, underneath it? The tabernacle, the glorious golden tabernacle. And we know that in that tabernacle, 
is not a symbol, like that cross is a symbol. That is, that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, His body and blood, soul, divinity. That is His throne. That is home. That is paradise. We next notice that that whole section of where the priest is with our Lord is separated from the people who come to Mass. That separation is important. It reminds us that we are on a voyage, on a ship. The church is the ship. We are headed, headed to heaven. But we have to have someone leading us, and it is the priest. He looks out over those stormy waters, and he knows where to lead us. He does that at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And everyone there in the nave, the Latin word nave for boat, we're following. How beautiful. We cannot help but notice the stations of the cross on either side of us, the stations of the cross which remind us of the passion of our Lord is about to happen on the altar. We have noticed before we came in the holy water the holy water font which reminds us of that important baptism, the thing that gives us the power to be able to come to Mass, but it also reminds us that we need to be purified, to be purified of our sins, because those sins are the only thing that can keep us from our Savior. Everything we described so far is all clutter unless we use those things properly, properly in the spirit that the church intends. Most of my friends were Protestants. They were very few Catholics, and I come from a very strong Catholic family, so that's helped. But just going to Mass and having the same responses and the Eucharist, it just it shows me what my faith is. Before you open that door to the church, you have to say, I'm leaving everything behind, everything that could distract me. I'm going to try my hardest. You make an act of the will. Because we are going to partake in something so awesome the most awesome thing that could ever happen on the face of this earth. No matter how many times you participate in the, the Mass, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, it's like you hear different things different times. I mean, there's just always new phrases or, or new understanding that I think can come to us over a lifetime. Every beautiful thing that we find in a Catholic church, altars, paintings, stained glass, holy water, kneelers, and crucifixes, become so much clutter when a man is not attentive. By attention, we mean not only that we know they're there, but we know what they are there for. And that knowledge lets those things lead me to God. That is the reason why that thurible is so impressive to a Catholic when he sees it just there in the sanctuary. It reminds him of the holiness of God, the God alone who deserves our adoration, our praise, our worship. A thing like the cassock that I am wearing, the cassock that a priest wears, it reminds Catholics that the priest is not merely a teacher like a professor in a classroom. He doesn't simply get ordained to go to a pulpit and preach every morning. He takes the place of Christ. His role is sacrificial. And that is the meaning of the cassock. He is like Christ. And at every moment of the day, he ought to remind the world and other Catholics by even what he wears that he is the person of a different world, reminding men that they have to come to a different world. The beautiful religious habit of a, of a nun, Mother Angelica, is so loved because 
aside from her wonderful warmth and sanctity, the habit, it engages us. It wants, it makes us want to go to Christ. It moves us deeply. So these things are not unimportant, and the church has always realized that. We are in the church. I might add something impresses us that we don't see. We only hear it. Silence. No one is speaking. There are a lot of people there, but no one is speaking. And yet everyone is speaking. More intimately there, without making any sounds, than they probably speak anywhere else. It's all interior. They're talking to our Lord, present in the tabernacle. And that's amazing, and that's the way it should be. For anyone to speak would be a terrible interruption, terrible discourtesy. Churches are not for speaking. Houses are for speaking. Meeting halls are for speaking. Playgrounds are for speaking to each other. And churches are for speaking to God. We only can do that in solitude and silence. And so the silence is really not an absence of something, an absence of sound. It is a fullness, and everyone senses it when they come into church. We might have missed last time looking at the altar and seeing candles. Very important. Candles are for fire, and fire has to do with Christ. We're reminded when we see the fire of the candles, our Lord saying that I have not come pump to come to bring peace into the world, but I have come to bring the sword. I have come to set the world on fire, our hearts on fire. Our Lord is the light of the world. Light brings illumination. And moreover, thirdly, the candle represents Christ because fire also brings warmth. The world is cold and harsh. It only becomes warm and secure when we are near Christ, symbolized by that candle. It gives off heat. It is fire. That is the reason why we have so many candles flanking the Blessed Sacrament when it is exposed for us for adoration. Why so many candles? Because here is the light of the world. It's not enough to know it, we have to see it. There's a literal conflagration of fire. It's not enough, though, for there to be things in church. We must be doing things at church. And we do some of those things before Mass even starts. We talked about that entrance. We forgot about the door. We enter through the door. It's very important. It's just not a door like any other door. It is a door there to remind us that we are leaving the earth and entering heaven. It is a perimeter. It is a boundary line. More importantly, that door reminds us of what our Lord said about himself. I am the door. Just as we have to pass through the humanity of Christ to come to heaven, that door is reminding us of that humanity. We have to pass through there in order to come into sanctifying grace. We place our hand in the holy water, don't we? We make the sign of the cross. What does that mean? It means so much. It's brimming with meaning. The first meaning is that our Lord on Calvary, represented at Holy Mass, has saved you and me to the very fiber of our being. Everything is saved. And that is the reason why we make the sign of the cross. It goes from the top to the very tip of our feet to side to side to remind us, and important we make it carefully, to remind us that our Lord has saved everything about me and everything in me must serve him. It is the sign of the cross because what is it that saved me? Calvary. Calvary, made, about to be made present on the altar. The sign of the cross is so important, we must never take it for granted. It is also the sign, of course, of the Blessed Trinity, that the Mass is glorifying every time that it takes place. The sign of the cross, I then move up that long aisle, 
that reminds me of the pilgrimage that is left for me to travel on earth? And what is it that I do? I make a genuflection. I place my knee to the ground. How important that is. Don't ever forget to do it. It is a marvelous act. Romano Guardini says in his beautiful work, Sacred Signs, that it is good for the soul for us to make genuflections and to kneel. What happens when I genuflect? I reduce my size by a half. I know that. I know that I stand in order to show someone my full stature. I stand so as to express my full dignity. I stand to impose my presence on someone else. When I genuflect, when I genuflect, I recognize that I am in submission to someone else. I am half what I should be, and that's as it should be. When I'm coming before the presence of Almighty God, I kneel. I make that genuflection to the ground. And as I do, I'm thinking of our Lord in the New Testament. I'm thinking of the storm on the Sea of Galilee and how when our Lord stills the waters, St. Peter, what does St. Peter do? He falls to his knees. Depart from me because I am a sinful man. The natural thing, falling to his knees because he's in the presence of God. Perfectly natural for you and I. I think of St. Thomas, don't you? St. Thomas in the upper room when he had been denying that Christ was really appearing to the apostles. And then our Lord stands there before him and smiles and said, Thomas, here, put your finger in my, the hole in my hand and in my side. And now be not unbelieving, but believing. What does St. Thomas do? He falls to his knees. He bows his head and he says, have mercy on me a sinner, my Lord and my God. We kneel. Kneeling is so important. At many times during the sacrifice of theirs, we'll be doing something with our hands. We'll be striking our breast. The striking of the breast is so important. St. Jerome used to have a rock that he pounded his breast with. What does that mean? It means I'm waking myself up. I'm waking myself up from my indifference, from my complacency, from my sins. It also means that I am punishing myself. I realize that I have done so much not to deserve Christ, and now I'm beating myself for it. I do that when I say, Lord, have mercy. When I say, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on me. Lord, I am not worthy to receive thee. All, all of this preparation brings us to the brink of Christ's action at Mass. That supernatural action of our Lord requires much attention to many details. Whether the details are stained glass windows or the crucifix, whether it be our genuflection or quiet recollection, each one is an important step in our approach to Christ. A soul unprepared receives less of Christ. Not that Christ is not there eager to come into souls, but he only enters where he is wanted. That desire can only be cultivated by you and me. The church will help us with the sacramentals, sacred things, sacred art, but ultimately the work of preparation depends on you and me. I am Father Pericon. Please join me next time for the most glorious act, our conversations on the Mass. Till then, God bless you.